1999 was a year at the Oscars. Host Whoopi Goldberg entered like this, Roberto Benigni did this, half of the jokes were about this, and people weren't sure how to react about this. But despite all of that, the Oscar coverage was about this. As Vincent Camby of the New York Times put it, Saving Private Ryan was lyrically humiliated when Shakespeare in Love took home Best Picture. Since its release in the summer of 1998, Saving Private Ryan had been the odds-on favorite, so when it lost Best Picture and several other major awards, the press and industry stepped back and asked themselves why. For most people, the answer was this guy. Harvey Weinstein may be the most taboo figure in Hollywood right now, but for a long time, it was impossible to imagine the Academy Awards without him. He didn't invent campaigning for awards. It's been going on since the Oscar was a glimmer in Louis B. Mayer's eye. But his campaigns for The English Patient, Chicago, The Artist, and more earned him the reputation of having invented the modern Oscar campaign. His success was so pervasive that most of Hollywood seemed willing to overlook his abusive behavior just to get in on it. More on this later. I usually talk about best actresses on this channel, and believe me, we'll get to Gwyneth. But in this episode, I wanted to spend some time on what made Harvey successful, not only because his tactics were integral to Gwyneth and Shakespeare in Love's wins, but also because the systems he created provide valuable insight into what campaigns look like today. I don't outline this stuff to make him sound impressive or to applaud him for his work. In fact, I think a lot of what he did damaged the integrity of the awards even further. But the fact that the industry replicated his methods tells us a lot about its values and a lot about why he got away with the shit he did for so long. In this video, I'll use the 1999 Oscars, and Gwyneth in particular, as a case study to learn what gave Harvey his power, and talk a little bit about why all of this feels horrible and gross. In 1979, Harvey and his brother Bob founded Miramax in Buffalo, New York. By the 1990s, Miramax had emerged as the most profitable, recognizable distributor of low-budget, critically acclaimed indie films in the United States, aided by its 1993 acquisition by Disney. Awards recognition became the cornerstone of Miramax's growth strategy, both because of the Oscars' very real economic implications and its symbolism as the benchmark of excellence. The kinds of movies that Miramax has tend to make a lot of their money after they make an Oscar nomination. It used to be that by the time the Oscars came around, you were mostly dealing with movies that had come and gone from theaters. It's not as true today with the smaller independent mm -hmm. films and the foreign films. An Oscar nomination can mean uh, you can double your, your, your grosses. But the degree to which they focus on the Academy Awards felt different. As Bill Mechanic, then chairman of Fox Filmed Entertainment, told the New York Times in 1999, Harvey Weinstein was unusual among studio executives because he was consumed above all with winning Oscars. Quote, they focused on one thing, the Academy Award process. So what tangibly did Harvey do to earn that reputation? Let's do a brief high-level overview of his tactics. First, Miramax sought access to Academy voters wherever and whenever possible. In Peter Biskin's book, Down in Dirty Pictures, former publicist Mark Ehrman described how Miramax set up screenings at the motion picture retirement home, for example, because Academy members lived there, even if they were on life support. They'd find out where people holiday in the period between Christmas and New Year's, and if it's in Aspen, they have screenings in Aspen. If it's in Hawaii, they'd have screenings in Hawaii. Miramax also targeted members individually, often calling them to nudge them in the right direction personally. In 1997, one Miramax representative allegedly convinced a retired actor to nominate Billy Bob Thornton for Best Actor in Sling Blade, even though the member barely even knew who Billy Bob Thornton was and originally assumed that Sling Blade was a Sylvester Stallone movie. Once an Academy member saw the film, Miramax utilized its savvy press relationships to keep the film top of mind. The LA Times stated that Miramax was the best at inducing the media to write and broadcast feature stories, creating a climate of anticipation, and then providing story ideas to keep the momentum going once the movie was in theaters. They provided ample opportunities to expose their talent to the press, lavish parties, galas, even gimmicky events. One of the most famous examples of this occurred when Harvey arranged for Daniel Day-Lewis to appear before Congress in support of the Americans with Disabilities Act. This was part of his successful Best Actor campaign for playing a man with cerebral palsy in My Left Foot. Miramax also invested heavily in advertising, especially in trade publications like The Hollywood Reporter and Variety. 
1997, the New York Times estimated that Miramax's Oscar season trade ads accounted for about 40% of the 200 pages devoted to award season promotions, a substantial portion of which was targeted specifically at Academy voters. If you pay attention to Oscar campaigns now, a lot of this might look really familiar. What once seemed like a studio's singular obsession now is an entire industry, because everybody noticed that it works really, really well. As the saying goes, Harvey Weinstein was thanked more often than God at the Oscars. Harvey Weinstein, Bob Weinstein. Harvey. Harvey and Bob Weinstein. And Harvey and Bob Weinstein. The Mishpuka Weinstein. Harvey Weinstein, who believed in us and made this movie. Thank you, Harvey Weinstein. Especially Harvey. And God, Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> the Punisher. Old Testament, I guess. Ha ha ha. Ha ha. According to Forbes, Weinstein's ability to orchestrate Oscar nominations and translate them into wins resulted in 341 nominations and 81 Academy Awards for films he and his brother produced or distributed. These numbers built the mythos of Harvey Weinstein. Like I said at the beginning of this section, wins bring money and prestige, so this guy had a whole lot of both, meaning a whole lot of power, and never was that more on display than in 1999 in what is considered his seminal masterpiece of Oscar campaigning. In July 1998, Saving Private Ryan was released to rave reviews, almost instantly becoming an American classic. Stephen Hunter's review in the Washington Post captured the fanfare most vividly. Quote, there are movies, and then there are movies. And then there is Steven Spielberg's Saving Private Ryan, searing, heartbreaking, so intense it turns your body into a single tube of clenched muscle. This is simply the greatest war movie ever made, and one of the great American movies. End quote. Then, that October, Shakespeare in Love came out. And while it didn't receive this is the peak of cinema fanfare, it did receive surprisingly positive reviews, to the point that many critics reevaluated Saving Private Ryan's certain hold on Best Picture. Saving Private Ryan versus Shakespeare in Love made for good press. The films had drastically different tones and represented the best of the weird amount of Elizabethan and World War II films that came out in 1998. They also represented interesting industry dynamics for the press to unpack. Articles pitted indie culture against studio blockbuster culture, and more specifically, positioned the race as a personal competition between Harvey and DreamWorks' Jeffrey Katzenberg, who, as former chairman of Walt Disney Studios, had helped orchestrate Disney's acquisition of Miramax. So generally speaking, the behind-the-scenes drama provided a more compelling narrative for the press than the actual merits of the films. Miramax's campaigning played a huge part in this, because not only did Harvey run his usual game, but he also upped the ante. Is it different this year for any reason? It's scrappier this year, haven't you noticed? <laughs> <laughs> scrappier. There's quite a bit of wrangling going now, on. What's going on? Well, um, the campaigning is, is a little more uh, yeah. stressful, I think, on all sides than it usually is. Is this all because Miramax is such effective marketeers of their program, of their movies, and so therefore the old guard in Hollywood has rebelled against that? That's one way of describing it. <laughs> this was a pretty widespread sentiment. Richard Corliss wrote in Time that, quote, the fact that most people even think that this is a horse race is mostly a tribute to Weinstein's entrepreneurial savvy, end quote. Nikki Fink's infamous piece in New York Magazine highlighted both Miramax's tactics and the resulting discontent of industry peers. First, there was the spending. Damien Bona, co-author of Inside Oscar, described being bombarded with Miramax ads. It's nothing new, he said. They've always done this, but the degree to which they've done it this year is astonishing. Fink noted that, quote, true independents might spend up to $250,000 on an Oscar campaign. Major studios, $2 million. But Miramax was estimated by competitors to have spent at least $5 million in its campaign for Shakespeare in Love. Katzenberg later admitted that this figure prompted DreamWorks to spend more promoting Save and Private Ryan. For in-person campaigning, Miramax hired, quote, a fleet of ultra-veteran Hollywood publicists who happened to be Academy members to schmooze their fellow Academy colleagues. They were paid not just during the five-month Oscar season, but nearly year-round, a practice which was then unheard of elsewhere in the industry. 
Miramax also threw a Welcome to America party for British Shakespeare and Love director John Madden that just happened to have several Academy voters present, seemingly violating a 1997 Academy rule that deemed it improper for studios to host receptions or dinners for Oscar nominees to which Academy members were also invited. Then there were the covert badmouthing efforts whisper campaigns that claimed Saving Private Ryan's only real value was in the first 20 minutes, and after that wasn't worth much of anything. Weinstein himself imparted this to at least one major critic. These efforts, of course, paid off, and Harvey himself got to accept the Best Picture Award. Eliza Perrin notes in Indie Inc, quote, that Shakespeare and Love's 1999 Oscar victory both reaffirmed Miramax's status as one of the key distributors of niche targeted films in the 1990s and confirmed that the company had effectively honed its marketing skills, end quote. Obviously, Shakespeare and Love's win was more complex than Harvey campaigns good. Many articles cited screeners, which are copies of films Academy members can watch at home, as a factor. Shakespeare and Love could play much more comfortably on VHS, as it would have been back then, than Saving Private Ryan, which benefits from the grandeur of a big screen. The Academy tends to like films about the artistic process, so jokes like this... And the title of this piece? Mercutio. Is it? I will play. <laughs> land really well. Many voters considered Saving Private Ryan too violent, which prompted some speculation that women didn't like it, which frankly seems like a very 90s assumption to make. Even Saving Private Ryan's release date was seen as a disadvantage. Eight plus months is a long time to sustain favoritism, especially when you have people actively working against you. But undoubtedly, campaigning helped shape the conversation about these films, and that conversation only benefited Gwyneth Paltrow's path to stardom was relatively fast-tracked. The daughter of TV producer Bruce Paltrow and queen of stage and screen Blythe Danner, she had grown up with the theater, eventually starring alongside her mother on the Williamstown stage. By age 19, she had the role of Wendy in Hook. In 1993, she received her first critical acclaim for Flesh and Bone. Her celebrity took off as she and Seven co-star Brad Pitt became Hollywood's newest it couple. Then, Harvey Weinstein and Miramax came calling. Gwyneth, who Harvey eventually referred to as the First Lady of Miramax, was exactly the kind of star Harvey wanted on Miramax's team. Eliza Perrin writes, quote, In an attempt to stay ahead of Fox Searchlight, Sony Pictures Classics, etc., Miramax signed a growing number of talent agreements and offered more of the back end to key individuals. The idea was to mimic some classic Hollywood business practices, enlist a number of likable young actors to star in sweeping historical epics. So it wasn't long before he gave her Emma, an adaptation of the Jane Austen novel, as her first star-making vehicle. Then came Shakespeare in Love, and major critical acclaim with it. Leia Lowenstein of Variety wrote that she had, quote, a luminosity that made Viola irresistible. Peter Travers wrote in Rolling Stone that she had, quote, never looked more radiant or acted with such spirit and made Will seem a changed man after one gander at her nipple. Wait, what? God. As the buzz around Shakespeare and Love increased, so did her profile, culminating in a Best Actress nomination. Her fellow nominees were Kate Blanchett and Elizabeth, Fernanda Montenegro in Central Station, Meryl Streep in One True Thing, and Emily Watson in Hillary and Jackie. Now, we sort of look at this race in retrospect as being between Kate and Gwyneth, and ultimately, it was, the two split awards fairly evenly going into Oscar night. However, critics largely believed that Fernanda Montenegro, Brazil's first lady of theater, gave the best performance of the year. And while she did win some critics' awards, she was never taken seriously as a real contender for the Oscar, which I'm sure has nothing to do with the Academy's excellent record on Latinas. It was easy to frame Kate and Gwyneth as part of a head-to-head -head race, because while they don't really have comparable roles, their films share time, place, and characters. They even share a lover, literally. But Gwyneth had two distinct advantages. First, people liked Shakespeare and Love a lot more than they liked Elizabeth. Reviews and box office corroborate this, as do the results of the Oscars, with Shakespeare and Love taking home seven and Elizabeth taking home just one. Second, and this is where Harvey helps, Gwyneth's press coverage was widespread and had a very specific tone. While researching this video, I was practically tripping over comparisons of her to Audrey Hepburn and Grace Kelly. 
She embodied the archetypal Hollywood ingenue, and reporters often used phrases like, it's her moment, and predicted that Shakespeare in Love would define her as the star of her generation. It seemed like there was a fascination with her as a cultural figure that Cate Blanchett never really had, and while that's not always a factor, it definitely breeds that way here, especially given what we know about the extensive behind-the-scenes campaigning. Are you here of your own free will? <laughs> Has someone coerced you <laughs> into being here? Do you count Harvey Weinstein as a coercer? Well, uh, now, Harvey, Harvey Weinstein is a, as a uh, I, I don't know whether he's in some kind of organized crime now, <laughs> but he used to be like some kind of junior mob kind of guy, right? He was, he was like in the mob auxiliary. That's what they tell me. Yeah, but, and now he's me. like a big, powerful film guy, right? Yes, I do all my movies for Harvey Weinstein. That's Miramax mm -hmm. for all of you. Yeah. And I'm lucky to do them there but he will coerce you to do it. And so, and so Harvey said... Knowing what we know now, it's impossible to look at this win the same way we might have even a few years ago. Gwyneth ostensibly represented the fairy tale version of what stardom was, and yet behind the curtain, she was stuck in what she recently described as a classic abusive relationship and had already fended off Harvey's propositions. Of course, she was one among many for him. By this time, he'd already settled several sexual assault cases. Cynically, I know I'm going to receive comments along the lines of, didn't he get her an Oscar? Why should she complain? Can we really feel bad for her? First of all, yes, because abuse in any form is wrong. Secondly, women shouldn't feel like they have to withstand abuse in exchange for work. Harvey silenced women through threats and legal action, but so did a culture that normalized the belief that you just have to ignore it if you want to succeed. Gwyneth, a very beautiful white girl from a prominent family, was petrified, convinced that her refusal would get her fired. Imagine how women less lucky than her felt. And it wasn't just Gwyneth. For every actress he helped, another was destroyed. Add to this that no one thought Harvey Weinstein was a nice, chill guy who could never abuse people. In fact, probably the best known thing about him other than his business savvy was that he was an abrasive, manipulative asshole. There are hundreds of articles about this dating back to the 80s. In 2004, Matt Damon called him a scorpion. Rolling Stone called him a big bad wolf. It goes on and on, and it was all public. Even if we give people the benefit of the doubt and assume none of them knew about the sexual assault, they were still completely fine with this otherwise offensive behavior. Why? I was going to say, don't you think everybody in Hollywood is actually just dying for Miramax to run a campaign for them? I mean, I, I can't imagine too many actors are offended by Miramax. They're just waiting to have a Miramax movie so they yeah. can win an Oscar yeah. someday. It's actually part of the reason they're able to get all these actors to sign on for no money in these mm -hmm. movies. They know that their odds of getting a nomination are probably twice as high when they're in a Miramax movie. It's a fact. For this, for an eight and a half pound little gold man, that is the exchange rate for politeness, professionalism, for women's bodies. Historically, society has been very forgiving of talented men who do bad things, and the past couple of years have certainly proven that Hollywood was slash is extremely guilty of this. I don't think it's a coincidence that his downfall occurred during his weakest professional streak since the 80s. Remember Tulip Fever? Yeah, neither did any Academy members. My point is, to a certain extent, the Oscars have been shaped in Harvey's image. And the Oscars are also part of a power structure that allowed him to exist as a predator for so long. It's painful, I think, to know all of this about him and simultaneously realize his influence on movies I really love. To watch him be praised and rewarded over and over. And to know that in the minds of some audience members, it was all worth it. So when I see these speeches now... The other guy that we really need to thank, though, is Harvey Weinstein, who had the guts, the courage, the commitment to make this picture and get it done. Here he is. I wonder, are they still thankful?